Okay, welcome to our next lecture in um, statistics at Dallas College. We are finishing up chapter one with um, 1.5 bias sampling. Here we're going to look at um, the sources of bias and sampling and how they differ. If the results of a sample are not representative of a population, then the sample has bias. There are three different types or sources of bias. There can be sampling bias, non-response bias, and response bias. So let's look at the first of these. Sampling bias means that the technique used to obtain the individuals to be in the sample tends to favor one part of the population over another. We've talked about convenience sampling, and this has sampling bias because the individuals are not chosen through a random sample. They're typically chosen, um, they're typically self-selected, okay? Another type of sampling bias occurs due to something called undercoverage, which occurs when the proportion of one segment of the population is lower in the, in the sample um, than it is in the population, and so this can possibly skew your results. Under coverage can result if the frame used to obtain the sample is incomplete or not representative of the population, um, or that you know you're using specific characteristics that actually have a bias towards the result of whatever you're researching. So let's look at an example to kind of explain this really clearly and simply. Um, sampling bias can lead to incorrect predictions. For example, the magazine. Um, Literary Digest predicted that Alfred Landon would defeat Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the 1936 presidential election. So what they had done is they conducted a poll based it on a list of its subscribers, telephone directories, and automobile owners. On the basis of the re results, the Literary Digest predicted that Landon would win with 57% of the popular vote. However, Roosevelt won the election with about 62% of the popular vote. Compared to current elections, these are huge majorities. We've seen really close races at the national level. Um, and so what happened here? Well, this survey was in 1936, which is still in the kind of the height of the Great Depression. Or, and um, most subscribers to the magazine or those households that had telephones or automobiles were Republican, which was the party of Landon. Therefore, the choice of the frame used to conduct the survey <coughs> led to an incorrect prediction due to sampling bias. Essentially, there was an undercoverage of Democrats in the poll and understanding how you know, the Democrats and Republicans made up the general population. And so they basically chose frames that were more biased towards the Republican Party, so their their prediction was biased toward that party. Uh, again, the, you know, this just shows that you have to be really kind of mindful of how you're doing your samples so that you get good data so that your predictions are more reliable or, you know, your results, in this case was a prediction, is more reliable. Non-response bias is our next type of bias, and this occurs when individuals selected to be in the sample just don't respond to the survey, and those absence of responses um, skew the survey because the people that didn't respond might have a different um, idea or answer. All suffers, I mean, all surveys suffer from non-response. There's, there's not a hundred percent survey rate typically. The federal government's current population survey has a response rate of 92%, but it varies depending upon the age of the individual. For the example, the response rate for 20 to 29 year olds is 85% versus individuals 70 and older, it's 99%. So you could see that, you know, here you might get skewed to an older opinion if you had the same number of people in each age group in the sample, then. Um, because the older individuals are, you know, responding at a higher rate, they could skew the results to um, potential opinions that are shared by that age group. And then here are some um, response rates. When you do random digital digit dialing telephone surveys, are typically around 70 percent. 
email surveys um, are pretty low because uh, it's really easy just to delete and we get so much email are over around 40 percent and mail surveys can have responses hot as high as 60 percent but i think in general that that seems pretty high to me for what uh, people would be willing to do uh, however a lot of mail surveys and other surveys maybe have imp um, improved their response rate um, through the use of what we call callbacks or by providing an award, a reward or an incentive. Callbacks, um, this is typically if you mail a questionnaire and it wasn't returned um, or email, etc. It just means contacting the individual again. A callback might mean phoning the individual or actually going out and conducting it in person. Um, this is a huge thing with the census. This is why the census, um, the um, the census in America that's done every 10 years, hires so many people, is that they want to get as accurate responses as possible. So while they mail out the census, um, they do have people that will go out door to door and try to get people to respond to the census. Another method to improve non-response rates is using rewards. Um, this might be a cash payment for completing a questionnaire. Um, or incentives such as a cover letter that states the responses to the questionnaire will determine future policy. For example, a city may send out questionnaires to households and state in a cover letter that the responses to the questionnaire will be used to decide pending issues with the city. And so if it's something that you know affects you, affects your life, your lifestyle, then you're more likely to complete that survey. Um, rewards are, are uh, controversial, you know, um, Often um, companies with products um, will pay people to review their product and you know when you're paying someone that sometimes leads to bias on the part of the respondent because they have a, a good feeling about the reward and especially depending upon what it is and how much it is, um, hey I might want to get another reward so I'm going to be nice to this company and this product etc. So you have to be careful with um, this kind of um, improvement in, in trying to get higher response rates that it doesn't bias um, the sample, okay? The last kind of sampling bias is called response bias. And this exists when you do get a response from um, someone in your sample, from an individual in there, but it doesn't reflect the true feelings of the person involved. And there's a number of different types of these. The first type is interviewer error, and it's really important to have a skilled interviewer if you're doing um, live interviews because um, the interviewer, a skilled and trained interviewer can elicit responses from individuals and make the interviewee feel comfortable enough to give truthful responses. Your text mentions that you know, that a really good interviewer can even get truthful responses to questions like, have you ever cheated on your taxes? Um, so you have to be careful and it's hard to know whether um, surveys were conducted by skilled or non-skilled um, interviewers um, and that you really shouldn't trust results um, if the sponsor of the survey um, has a, um, a stake in the game. Again, this is kind of like when companies uh, create surveys about their own products um, so that you know often that they are biased because they want good results or they want a specific result and so they ask questions in such a way um, to get that result like in, again in your text it says would you trust a survey conducted by a car dealer that reports 90 percent of customers say they would buy another car from the dealer they're the one conducting the, the survey, and so it's not an unbiased um, perspective, per se. Another type of uh, response bias is misrepresented answers. Um, some survey questions result in responses that misrepresent facts or are flat-out lies. One of the most common of these is reporting of salary. Um, the book says that um, that a survey of recent college graduates may find that self-reported salaries are inflated, but typically if you look at survey data, um, a lot of salary data, in, um, income data, um, tends to be inflated by people. And I, 
I don't know if it's wishful thinking on the part of the respondents or what causes it. Another example they give in the book is how many push-ups people can do in a minute and then ask them to do the push-ups. How accurate do you think they were? It's pretty funny and interesting. Wording of questions is really important, and, and this is something that most people don't get. They think, oh, doing a survey is easy. I'll just write some questions, get the answers. But it's really easy to make mistakes and to bias the response of the person um, to answering a certain way. One of the, or just to confuse people. One of the things um, you want to avoid in, in questions is um, negation. Do you not want this? You know, it gets confusing if I say yes, I don't want it, and if I say no, I do want it. So you try to use negation in all of them. Um, but the way a, word, a question is worded can lead to response bias in surveys. So they have to be always balanced, and you really should try to get someone to review it to see if it, um, uh, you know, really does appear uh, that either answer is okay, that you're not leaning towards one. In the book, they give an example of a yes-no question. It says, do you oppose the reduction of estate taxes? And they, they say this, um, again, you're leading people to uh, an answer. And um, they, they rewrote it instead of, do you oppose the reduction of a tax, which um, most people would say, no, I don't, re you know, most people hate taxes, so they would always want to reduce taxes which has implications elsewhere, but we're not going to get into that. But they were saying that this could be better written as, do you favor or oppose the reduction of estate taxes? So in the first one, do you oppose, you're leading to kind of one answer, yes or no, instead of getting someone to step back and, and think, do I oppose or, it's still a little bit of a, a quandary here. And it's when you're asking questions that are um, typical or you have a more idea, okay? There's a really interesting example in, in your text as well around this type of bias of wording of questions. And so they give this example how the same question was worded in two different ways. Do you think the United States should forbid public speech against democracy? Was one question. Do you think the United States should allow public speech against democracy? So one said, do you think the U.S. should forbid it or do you think the U.S. should allow it? 21% um, of the first one gave yes responses, while almost 50% of the second one gave no responses, which is the same thing. Um, the conclusion you may arrive at is that most people are not willing to forbid something, but more people are willing not to allow something. These results show how wording a question can alter another outcome, uh, can alter the survey's outcome. The other thing is not to be vague. The question, how much do you study, is too vague. Does the researcher mean, how much do I study for all my classes or just for this class? Does this researcher mean per day, per week, per course? Um, so a better question would be written, how many hours do you study statistics each week? So again, the wording of questions is really important. And this to me is one of the big ones that, that people overestimate their ability to create a good survey. And you, if you've been in business a while, you've already seen this. If you haven't, you certainly will see it. We, we get a lot of surveys in companies and organizations that we're in and who we work for. And even there, they, they're often poorly worded. The order of questions are word. Surprisingly, even if you write good questions, sometimes, well, the ordering of words is also, you know, could be part of number three here. Um, the book uses the example of, of using approve or disapprove in your question. Um, if you put it, do you disapprove or approve, you tend to get a better, more reliable answer. And, and it's weird how they rationalize that, and, and but surveys have pointed that out. Um, but the order of questions as well can have an effect that um, sometimes they'll rearrange um, questions within a, a survey uh, to, to make sure that answers to prior questions um, are not affecting questions later on. Um, 
Here's some good examples in the book. I'm not going to go through these, but uh, you might want to look at them for how they've rearranged them um, and uh, both the questions and also um, the wording. The type of question open or closed. One of the first considerations in designing a question is determining whether the question, whether the question should be open or closed. An open question allows the respondent to choose his or her own response um, out of anything they want to pick. For example, what is the most important problem facing America's youth today? And leaving a blank for that person to respond. A closed question requires the respondent to choose from a list of predetermined responses, multiple choice, if you will. What is the most important problem facing America's youth today? A, drugs, B, violence, C, single parent homes, D, promiscuity, and E, peer pressure. In closed, in closed questions, the possible responses should be rearranged as we saw before, because respondents are likely to choose early choices in a list rather than later choices. And an open question should be phrased so that the responses are similar. You don't want a wide variety of responses. This allows for easy analysis of the responses. Um, closed questions limit the number of responses and therefore the results are easier to analyze. Um, trying to limit an open question can be very difficult, so it's very important the wording there as well. The last part is data entry error. Although not technically a result of response bias, Data entry error will lead to results that are not representative of the population, which, you know, absolutely makes sense that the person said yes and you keyed it as a no. If this happens um, in a large scale way, of course, you're you're skewing the entire survey. Again, although not technically a result of response bias, data entry error will lead to results that are not representative. Once data are collected, the results may need to be entered into a computer which could result in input errors, or a, respondent make, or a respondent may make a data entry error. For example, 39 may be entered as 93. It is imperative that data be checked for accuracy. Um, in the text, we represent some suggestions for checking for data error. Finally, there's sampling error versus non-sampling error. Non-sampling errors result from undercoverage non-response bias, response bias, or data entry error, as we've already gone through. Such errors could also be present in a complete census of the population. Sampling errors occur, these result from using a sample to estimate information about a population. Um, and this type of error occurs because a sample gives incomplete information about a population. Uh, the book uses this as a, as a reference. Um, you can think of sampling error as error that results from using a subset of the population to describe the characteristics of the whole population, whereas non-sampling error is an error that results from obtaining and recording the information collected. So while this is not technically part of section 1.5, I wanted to cover at a high level um, the steps in conducting an experiment, because I think it's important, and we're not actually including 1.6 in this um, course, but if you want to review some of this, it's not a very long section, um, and it's pretty straightforward, but again, I think it's important. Um, and when you're conducting an experiment, of course, the first step is to identify the problem to be solved or the question to be answered. The statement of the problem should be as explicit as possible and should provide the experimenter with direction, like how can I find that information or some insight into the problem. The statement must also identify the response variable and the population to be studied. Often the statement is referred to as the claim, like you know, uh, what, you, you know what you believe, like your hypothesis that all young people do A or something like that, or, or the majority of young people will do A or something, okay? <clears throat> Step two is determine the factors that you believe affect the response variable. The factors are usually identified by an expert in the field of study. In identifying the factors, ask yourself what things affect the value of the response variable. Is it age? Is it race? Is it income? It could be a, a myriad of things. Okay. After the factors are identified, determine which factors to fix at some predetermined level, which to manipulate and which to leave uncontrolled. 
Step three, determine the number of experimental units. As a general rule, choose as many experimental units as time and money allow. Um, techniques such as those discussed later in the book in sections 9.1 and 9.2 exist for determining sample size um, provided certain information is available. Step four, determine the level of each factor. There are two ways to deal with the factors, um, which is to either control it or to randomize it. Control, there are two ways to control factors. Set the level of factor at one value throughout the experiment if you're not interested in its effect on the response variable. Set the level of a factor at various levels if you're interested in its effect on the response variable. The combinations of the levels of all the varied factors constitute the treatments in the experiment. Randomize. Randomly assign the experimental units to treatment groups. Because it's difficult, if not impossible, to identify all factors in an experiment, randomly assigning experimental units to treatment groups mutes the effect of variation attributable to factors, um, explanatory variables specifically that are not, and this will not be controlled. Conduct the experiment. Replication occurs when each treatment is applied to more than one experimental unit. Using more than one experimental unit for each treatment ensures the effect of a treatment is not due to some characteristic of a single experimental unit. This is really important. You know, that's why we do, you know, sample sizes, etc. It's a good idea to assign an equal number of experimental units to each treatment. Collect and process the data. Measure the value of the response variable for each replication, then organize the results. The idea is that the value of the response variable for each treatment group is the same before the experiment because of the different treatment because of randomization. Then any difference in the value of the response variable among the different treatment groups is a result of differences in the level of treatment. And then finally, test your claim. This is the subject of inferential statistics. Inferential statistics is a process in which generalizations about a population are made um, on the basis of the results obtained from a sample. Provide a statement regarding the level of confidence in that generalization as well. Methods of inferential statistics are presented in chapters 9 through 15. I know that I just went through that at lightning speed, but I wanted you to just to kind of get a feel for those steps. Um, and, you know, take 10 minutes and read through this section in chapter 1.6. Um, you know, many jobs involve statistics, many jobs and roles involve surveys, and it's not quite as simple as people believe it to be. People always oversimplify, in my experience in work and at school, um, how easy it is to collect data. And um, as you've seen through this section, there's a lot of bias and errors that can be made on all parts, on the parts of people being surveyed, on the parts of the, of the tools that we're using, and then even how we're gathering the data. So um, anyway, I think this is important for almost any career. And um, so take a few minutes and, and at least skim through chapter um, 1.6.